everybody so it's a couple minutes past so I'm going to go ahead and get started and if people join and that's great uh, so I'd like to take a couple minutes just to welcome everybody to tonight's webinar on the topic of having a family during residency my name is Julia Curtis and I'm a PGY4 resident in psychiatry at Memorial University in Newfoundland and I'm also the co-chair of RDOX wellness committee it's my great pleasure to introduce the two panelists for tonight's discussion Dr. Christina Nowick is currently a PGY6 resident in maternal fetal medicine at UBC. Before starting this fellowship, she was an Aubine resident at Queens in their clinician investigators program. She's a past RDOC president, and Christina has been instrumental in the development and implementation of RDOC's resiliency curriculum. So thanks so much, Christina, for joining us tonight. Dr. Terry Colburn is a PGY4 uh, resident in respiratory medicine at the University of Manitoba. He is currently an RDOC training committee member and a past RDOC vice president. He was also a board member representing the Professional Association of Residents and Interns of Manitoba. Throughout his residency, he has been heavily involved in issues pertaining to postgraduate medical education. So thanks so much, Terry, for joining us. And of course, they're both proud parents. So just to, before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so the RDOC Wellness Committee has come up with a list of questions for Christine and Terry, and mostly to just sort of get the conversation going. And we've definitely left ample time uh, for all the attendees to ask questions. And these can be submitted through the chat window uh, that's built into the Zoom application. So I'll we'll see them and get to pose them to our panelists. So please feel free to jump in with your questions at any time. Uh, additionally, this webinar is going to be recorded and it's going to be posted to the RDOC YouTube channel at a later date. So if uh, any of your colleagues were unable to attend tonight, um, please let them know that it's going to be posted and um, they can view the recording at a later date or if people wanted to refer back to it, it'll be available for you guys to review. So uh, with that, I guess we can go ahead there and uh, get started. So. First question I uh, wanted to pose to you both. Um, so it's our understanding that both of you had had the experience of starting the family during residency. When you were making this decision, if in fact it was a decision, what were your initial fears about having a family during residency? And maybe Christina, we can start with you and then go to Terry. Um, I think when you're uh, a kind of a type A resident and like, like well, everybody's busy. Some people are more type A than others, but um, you know, you're scared about how you can fit everything in because I think I was used to already completely jam packing my, my schedule with, with residency and reading and other activities. Um, and so how are you going to fit this life changing human into it? Uh, and I think that's probably very common and up at the top of most people's concerns. Um, uh, and that was just kind of an unknown and I just figured I needed to delve in. Um, I think on the kind of practical program level, um, I was very worried about what becoming pregnant would mean for my Royal College exam. Um, and it actually turned out to be a bit of a valid concern. So I think this is something that a lot of women think about. Um, but uh, my situation was a bit unique in that I had done the clinician investigator program. So I was already set to graduate December 31st of the year in which I was going to take my Royal College exam. Um, and most of that was CIP research time, but some of it was clinical. Um, so I, I was worried that there would be an issue with qualifying for my Royal College exam. So that was, that was very front of mind. And I wound up keeping my pregnancy secret probably longer than most gynecology residents managed to. Um, and, uh, it did actually turn out to be a bit of an issue, and I know that some other um, female residents have had this issue as well, that I was basically made to promise that I would not take uh, a maternity leave that would push my clinical work past December, um, or they would not um, allow me to qualify for my exam. Anyways, everything worked out fine, and, I, and my residency program was extremely supportive. My fellowship program has been extremely supportive, but that was my, those were my two big fears. The, the big kind of existential, how am I going to do it all fear, and the very practical, am I going to be able to write my exam fear. Okay, perfect. And Terry, I don't know if you would like to build on sort of your fears when you were looking at becoming a parent. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm sorry for that interlude there. My dog started barking and it's going to wake up 
both of my children. Um, That's the biggest fear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think so. I just a little bit of background. I have, I have two uh, young boys. One's eight months and one's two and a half years. So if you do the math, I've had two kids in residency. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of my fear is centered around becoming a parent for the first and second time. Um, and, and if you want to focus, I guess, a little bit more on the residency aspects, I think I have very similar concerns, uh, to, uh, Christina, like there's very lim limited time when you're a resident and so how to fit in caring for two young kids or the first time the, the one young child, um, was something that we, uh, we dwelled on a lot, but I, I think specific to me, it's still a concern for me. And, and that's how the decision to have kids um, has impacted kind of my career path. Um, because when I first had kids, I was a second year resident in internal medicine. I didn't know even what subspecialty I would end up in. Um, and now I'm considering what sort of fellowship programs I, I might be pursuing in, in about a year and a half. Um, and, and so that, you know, having children impacts on that. Um, to to a large extent, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, my wife and I will make decisions that um, will seek to compromise the situation that we're in, and and I think at the end of the day, it's all going to work out, but it's still certainly a large amount of uncertainty and um, something that we continue to deal with. So those were were and continue to be my fears with with having kids, and yes, planned planned children. <laughs> Um, I, I would also expand on on the Royal College thing. So I just wrote my Royal College and I did it on pat leave. And actually when we had the second child, I was thinking that having a, a child and potentially going on parental leave during my study period might be helpful. Um, and I think it was and that I wasn't, you know, working at the time. But I, I, I think having kids leading up to a Royal College exam, it would presented a much bigger challenge than than I even could have anticipated. So you know, hopefully I pass, I'll find out next week, but uh, I have to agree with, uh, with Christine on that front. Okay, perfect guys. I think that that highlights concerns that, you know, a lot of residents that are actively planning a family do think about. So thanks so much for that. Uh, so Terry, maybe we can start off uh, with you answering the next question. So uh, to your knowledge, what are the parental leave guidelines in your region? Yeah, so, um, you know, with respect to the amount of time that you can take off, I, I think that's largely a negotiation that people have with their programs. Um, you know, my wife took six months parental leave for both of our kids. So in total, she's taken a year from her program and, and I will have taken approximately three months. Um, and, uh, and both of those were discussions with the programs. We both had very supportive programs. Um, Doctors Manitoba, which is our provincial uh, medical association, has a great program where they actually will provide a top up of salary on top of the employment insurance for up to 17 weeks. Um, so a great financial option for people who are considering this. Um, and then the employment insurance, I think this is a, a Canada wide, but I might be wrong, um, is a 35 week max between both parents. Um, and so, like, I think there's there's good financial support there, and I think that that does impact on people's decision. Um, but I'm not aware of really any other limits or any other guidelines beyond that. And it's certainly something that that we've taken advantage of and, and worked from a financial uh, flexibility perspective. Okay, perfect. And Christina, we'll pass it over to you. Um, I don't think it's too different. I have to admit, I, I don't know too much about parental leave because I only wound up taking um, 16 weeks off. Um, but certainly I was on a PARO contract then and, um, and through PARO, there's a top up from EI. Um, EI winds up being 55% up to, I think, a, a certain insurable earnings, which, which by R5 we, we surpass. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, from a financial point of view in that way residency is a great time to have children because you don't have to worry about not only not having income if you're a fee-for-service physician but then also covering your overhead and your practice and getting a locum there are all kinds of stressors that make residency a little bit easier because you can just um, step away uh, 
important points for women, I guess, are about call. Um, so I think at the time it was no call after 32 weeks, but I think in Ontario, it's actually decreased in their last contract since then, the gestational age after which you can't do overnight in-house call, um, which uh, I mean, my program, I was pr studying for my exam anyways, so we were off and that was, that was fine. Um, I think, I mean, those are the, those are what's prescribed in the, um, in the collective bargaining and collective agreements, but that's pretty different from the policies that people face in practice. I think for the most part, you know, so for instance, um, at Queens, suddenly after they discovered that I was going on maternity leave, they started to try to enforce that women wouldn't take more than six months or whatever it was to be able to take the Royal College exam in the same year. I don't know why um, that became such a priority. Um, there are, you know, if you're planning on going into fellowship, there are some fellowships who will only allow you to start July 1st. And I think residency programs now too. So, so there are some other things to, to think about. Um, but I can at least say for Paro that it's very, they've laid it out well. It's very easy to find on the website. They have a whole parenting page and, and um, their staff are very knowledgeable. So to learn what the policies are, it's pretty clear. They're very helpful. If, if I could just uh, expand on the, the leave part of it. Um, so I, I, sorry, I can't remember how many weeks you said, I think it's 32 weeks for, uh, for um, people here in terms of being excused from call when pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the Royal College programs, what I'm aware of is, is that there, there's a, an allowance that the Royal College will allow programs to waive training uh, for residents who go on uh, leaves, including parental leave. Right. Um, so it, really any leave of absence. Um, so what I'm facing right now is the possibility of potentially waiving six weeks of the 10 weeks that I've taken for parental leave because my fellowship is two years long. Um, and so that's something that I've already discussed with my program before even, in, you know, starting my R4 year because I was anticipating that this would be a leave that I would have. Um, but ultimately, it's the programs who decide whether or not they would support you in that leave. And then it's an application to the Royal College. And that's sort of a national policy that exists. Yeah. I guess I should clarify the leave. Um, so Queens it has an exceptional policy that it will not forgive any time for for leaves. And oh, so wow. what they're really enforcing is so say uh, say I was on track, you know, to take my exam and graduate June thirtieth, um, and I became pregnant. If I had the intention of taking six months and one day of maternity leave they would not sign off my fighter or whatever it is postgrad has to do to send to the Royal College so that I could qualify for the exam. I see. And I know that I know that some other residents have been, been having issues with that in other faculties. So um, it's just something to to clarify because I can't imagine studying and then not being able to take the exam. I, so it's just something to work out ahead of time. Yeah. It's also not fair, but it's something to work out ahead of time. Did we lose Julia? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Are there questions from the group in the meantime? I'm not seeing dots. I think the next question we had, Christina, was uh, do you think the current provincial guidelines for, uh, or sorry, as a physical physician parent, what resources did you use, find most useful for understanding the unique policies and support of your province? Um, like I said, uh, Pero had a very um, well laid out um, web page, and so that's that's all I really used. Um, but then for the for the things that don't have to do with the provincial guidelines, like we were saying, to talk with your program director and figure things out locally. Yeah, very similar for us. I think we also leaned on co-residents who had been through this before. So in particular, my wife's program. Um, uh, being that she's an OBS guy, and there were a number of people who had actually uh, taken leaves ahead of her, and so she had a lot of resources to lean on. But the program admins, I think, um, you know, quite homogeneously are quite informed about the financial aspects and how to, you know, get in touch with the regional health authority and organize all the pay. Um, and then everything else really fell to Param, and I, I think they're well, well organized around that as well. Yeah, yeah. I think what you're saying about the informal circle of people who have just done it ahead of you, that becomes what you do for for everything in parenting. Yes. <laughs> um, 
Terry, do you think the provincial guidelines in Manitoba are reasonable? Yeah, I think they're reasonable. Um, certainly, you know, the, the again, the, going into the financial aspects of Dr. Manitoba, I've talked to residents from other provinces, um, and it didn't seem like that was some, the resource that they were able to access. So I think that's something we certainly enjoyed and allowed us, allowed us to have a little bit of breathing room from a financial perspective while on leave. Um, I think, again, that flexibility around there not really being a limit or an implication of taking six months and a day, seemingly, um, I think was something that we've also both enjoyed. Um, we were quite deliberate in, in Sarah taking six months the first time, recognizing that she could take six months again and still be um, able to only be one year further back in her training. And that hasn't had any other implications uh, in terms of you know having to to redo rotations or uh, get reassessed for certain competencies, um, it's hard to say what that will look like with competency by design, of course. Um, but you know, I certainly being having been in two different programs, I think you know the discussions that I had around leave were different between the two programs. I wouldn't say that I would, you know that I wouldn't have been supported in either case. I think that I certainly would have been supported if I had taken the leave with the first child. And uh, the, the reasons I didn't were personal, um, but I, I think uh, you know there there's there's always going to be a program by program difference in how they handle these leaves and whether you know if they don't have a strict policy as you alluded to at Queens uh, about the flexibility of of, of uh, not um, not requiring you to do every single week of training and and having the option to waive things if you do take a shorter leave or need some flexibility as you head to the, the transition to practice piece and looking at fellowships away. So we have a question. Um, oh, I just saw my, oh. Do you know of any groups, medical or non-medical, that are good supports for young slash new parents? It's hmm. a great question. I think, um, again, I, I think, we just rely on our group of friends who have been through this before. Um, that's, you know, I think that we, I, I thought about supports before and I, I think, you know, there's supports within the program. So um, when, I, when we went back to work or when Sarah went back to work and as I expect to go back to work, uh, we have really strict scheduling. <laughs> like we're very organized. We need to be, we have two kids. Um, daycare pickups, we can't have conflicting call schedules. And so we really rely on our co-fellows to step up and help out and swap swap call when we need to, for example. I, I don't know if you found something similar, if you've tapped any other resources. I think this is where the moms have it together a little bit more than the dads, the, <laughs> uh, the community. Um, so there is, there are Facebook groups for moms and medical and geographical and stuff. And those can be very active and really supportive and very informative for a whole slew, like any question that you could possibly have about anything in the world, it seems you can get an answer. Um, and you know, there's, you'll find a group for breastfeeding and this, you know, wearing your baby and there's all kinds of online social media support out there for for moms um locally and this is totally non-medical at least in vancouver I, i'm sure in in most places um there are lots of groups for new parents it's it's often more mothers who go but um but just you know community drop-ins with babies can be a great place to to get support and they'll often have um discussions about different topics um, like feeding or what to do with a sick baby or body image, just random stuff. Um, and I haven't, well, because I moved, I moved back home. So I kind of have my old circle, but I've heard a lot of people say that they've met some of their closest friends um, through those kinds of drop-in parent groups just at the local community center. But that'll be different for depending on where people are. Yes, Dr. Milk is a great informative Facebook group for breastfeeding Dr. Roms. I guess everybody can see this, so I don't have to repeat it. Um, Bryce's question actually um, is something that we had planned to talk about. So, um, Christina, I don't know if you want to touch on the process of coming back to work, um, what challenges you faced, what call was like that first time. Yeah, I think one of the most difficult parts of being, uh, of having children in residency is that there's no process for coming back to work. You go from zero to 60 and you're back. 
Um, and it, if you're lucky, you can organize it to come back to a lighter rotation, but a lot of people um, don't seem to have that in their schedule either. So you can just be dropped right back into um, a really heavy rotation call. Um, and there's not a lot of ramp up and not a lot of time built in for you to get used to how to balance having your family and being back at work. Not to mention the fact that depending on how much time you took off, you might be rusty, um, which is normal and okay, but it definitely happens. So I took four months off um, right at the end of my residency, um, just after my exam, which was excellent from an exam point of view. Um, I really got to enjoy my mat leave because I didn't have to study, um, but it was being right at the end of residency, meant that I didn't have residency to go back to to re-solidify before I was jumping into fellowship and locuming. Um, but I also hadn't had that experience under my belt to feel really confident about my surgical skills. I think for, for procedures, it's a bit more of a, mm, a bit more of a, a difficult uh, thing. It's something you worry about more. Um, so that was hard to to come back and feel a, a little bit rusty about you know it takes your mind a bit longer to work through the same problem you could work through much quicker before but then also just your your hands don't feel quite as good um i think after about six months or six weeks sorry i um felt back to myself and felt confident um but that first period it's you know i think when you're a new grad you're probably already questioning your own skills and your own competence to be to be independent, um, and so to have that was was tough. But um, but but you get through it. Um, I did do one thing that I found really helpful, which was I came back to work, and I had three weeks of work, and then I booked a week of vacation. So, no matter how hard it was and how you know down I might feel about how my brain was working I knew I just had to get through three weeks and then I would have a break and then I would have time with baby so it was kind of this working towards a short-term goal which made it much easier and so I would definitely recommend planning to have um, an early vacation um, also so I went back to work and I started off in my fellowship program and it's a bit tougher to go back where people I think if you go back to your own program you have the benefit of the or people give you the benefit of the doubt. They knew you were awesome and maybe you're a little bit rusty, which you might not get in a new place. But um, truly, I don't know, everybody's so excited about you having a baby and they ask you about that. I think much more of it's in your own head than, than real, but, um, but it's still hard to have it in your head. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I go back to work next week and my first half day is in the Bronx suite. Um, and I haven't, you know, looked at a bronchoscope in some time. And so, it's a little bit nerve wracking, um, but I'm sure it will be a, a short lived thing, as you said, um, especially with having very supportive and, and, you know, we're a small program. So there are uh, a lot of supportive staff, a lot of supportive co-fellows. One of the things that uh, we found really challenging um, was, you know, dealing with call and breastfeeding um, and, and yes. having to pump. Um, so we, we have very limited structural resources in our, in our hospitals for, for that sort of thing. And so, um, with the first kid, um, with, with Arthur, our firstborn, we had a, a really hard time maintaining that, um, with Sarah's call schedule. And so we eventually just, just gave up, um, and we were totally comfortable with it. It, it was a huge relief to not have to have that pressure going all the time. Um, and this time we didn't even, we didn't even question it. Um, you know, we, we just transitioned to formula kind of within the first month um and and i i you know if that's something that people have to deal with i think um you know it, it's it's whatever your own values are in terms of how you care for your kids but uh but i think you should uh recognize that um you know those are stresses where there's there's other options available and and really take a look at that and you know i, I think you know that's one thing that um is is not well thought out in our hospital system like the the I think, you know, Sarah was pumping in a shared call space, um, which, which is unfortunate. And so, and not that that was the huge deterrent. It was really the schedule that was the deterrent because yeah. you can, it, it's really hard to, to do the transport and, and just the, the sheer time it takes to do that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that was a really big challenge and stress for us and, and something that we, we found a way to manage our, around the next yeah. time. I'm so glad you brought that up because I hadn't thought about it, but it, so yeah, you come back and you have this extra task 
that can take like an hour a day um, when you add up all the, like you say, transport and cleaning and sterilizing and everything. Um, I, I mean, being in obstetrics and gynecology, it was nice that the staff just inherently knew why pumping was important and why I had to go now. But, but I think if you're in a residency program and you, and you decide you want to try pumping, it helps to educate people because I think people until they've had a kid don't realize that you need to put your foot down and pump every so many hours, because if you don't do that, you will lose your supply and then you won't be able to breastfeed your baby anymore. And I'm sure people just, people just don't know. And I think if you, a little bit of education, I think goes a long way. Um, and then also, I don't know, I decided to put my foot down a little bit and I was, and I just, I just made time. I was very like, I pumped openly in, in the locker room, wherever it had to be, but I would tell my staff, I'd say, listen, I need to disappear for a few minutes and do this. And it was always fine, but I did have to kind of put my foot down and, and just announce that it was happening. Yeah. Perfect. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So sorry. I'm in Burnley, Finland, and I think my internet has blipped out there. But um, no, thanks so much, guys, for uh, those important points. We've got another question, actually, from one of the attendees. So Suzanne asks, is there a better time, in quotations, to have a baby while in residency? So, for example, like pre-exam time versus earlier when you have more call versus the very end of your residency. Also wondering about the sort of length you take of leave. So three months versus six months or up to a year. What was your experience for the length of break and others that you know that have gone through the process? So, Christina, maybe we can start with you? Sure. Um, I'm sure there's not a best time, like biologically, we should all have kids at 20, right? So, um, so I, I, there are good things and bad things about every time. Um, the time that we chose turned out to be right for us. Um, I will say, so I wound up being 33 weeks pregnant at my OSCE and it was because we, we really did I can't remember. We just, we, we definitely planned it with gestational age in mind. And I didn't want to be in my first trimester at the OSCE in case I was going to be really nauseous. And anyway, so we, we had this window where we decided we would try and it ended up working out. Um, but it was great to deliver after, um, after the OSCE because I just studied through my pregnancy and luckily felt well during my pregnancy, but then didn't have the added stressor of a crying baby to, which would obviously be more tiring, even if, um, even if pregnancy is not as easy as not being pregnant for studying. Um, but then that means you're older than you are when you started residency and that, that that's different for everybody. Like women's fertility starts to decrease at age 32. So you can't put it off forever, but, um, but, it is, it is nice being a little bit more senior in my training. I'm obviously not staff, but even as a senior resident and as a fellow, I think you can, um, you, you either have more flexibility or you feel confident about asking for things and, and it's a bit easier to control your schedule, I think. So that wound up being right for us. Um, I did have a PPROM scare at 31 weeks, the morning of my written exam. And I thought, I've got enough time to go get antibiotics and then go to my exam. <laughs> <laughs> but I turned out not to have pee from, so it's fine. Um, and wow. in terms of how long to take, that is so, it, it totally depends on, you know, your, well, what residency program you're in, just how much time you think you want to take off, um, I think, like your age and how much you want to get done with it. Although, although I guess it's not really, at the end of the day, a big difference. Um, but I, there's specific concerns to being in a surgical specialty, I think. Um, not that I would deter anybody from taking a year, but I find that there are not that many surgical residents who take a year. And I would think it's because you feel that you lose some skills. But I, but, I mean, it's a personal decision. And I would not mean to say that someone who took a year is not going to be just as great at the end of the day as someone who didn't. But it seems to be less common. Um, taking four months, I felt a little short because... Um, by four months, she was just starting to sleep sort of maybe, and I mean like three or four hours at a time, but you're just starting to emerge from this fog and the kid's not as delicate anymore. And it was getting really fun. And then, and then I went back, but, um, but there are different circumstances for everybody and, um, and you kind of just have to, to pick what's best for you. But, uh, I haven't heard many people re 
regret. I have, I've heard way more people say they took too little time than too much time. Yeah, yeah I think just to concur, I, I think Christina, as you said, it's a very individual decision. So I think there's, you know, for us, as I said, uh, Sarah took two six month leaves. So that was the time because we knew that we would did not want to be more than a year behind and the first child we had in our second year of residency. So we knew that regardless of what, how that first child and, and his early years went, there was always the potential to have a second child in residency. Um, and, and so we went with six months. Um, for me, there was no leave the first time, largely in part due to my second round of CARMS. I, you know, it would have coincided exactly with interviews and I might as well have, you know, not been on leave because I would have been traveling around the country and it would have been just as challenging as it ended up being. So we needed to have that childcare in place as a permanent or as a full-time solution. Um, and the, the second time, I'm very happy that I've been able to take some time off, um, but it did happen to happen for me right around the time of the Royal College. Um, and it turns out being home and taking care of two kids is a lot harder than being at work. Um, <laughs> so like studying is just has been quite minimal for me. Um, and, and, you know, I think some of that you can anticipate, but you know, I, I, I don't think there's a lot of people who are in the situation of having two children uh, who are under the age of two and a half right before the Royal College. Um, but at the same time, I think like what I'm reflecting on right now is is what you said about being more senior. Um, and so um, actually with both children, I had the opportunity to, um, you know, be in my chief year and do a lot of schedule making. And so it, I had a lot of flexibility in my schedule and being able to avoid Sarah's one and four, um, which I think was was immensely helpful. Um, and so, and, and I know that when Sarah was in her second year and going back from her six month leave, you know, a lot of those surgical skills that you alluded to were just sort of in their prime development stages um, right before she took her leave. And so there was a little bit of a, a restart that needed to happen. Whereas I think the second time, a lot of it was uh, like riding a bike, uh, as I mentioned, um, um, an opportunity for her to, to, to not necessarily like, I think it was more, as you mentioned, timing and what your hands are doing and not necessarily having to think through all the skills. So, so there is some advantage to being a little bit later. Um, but, but again, we made this decision based on we were in our personal circumstances, not our professional circumstances. Um, we, you know, were in our thirties and it was time and we were very happy with where we were personally. And so, there's never going to be a good time, whether you're a junior resident, a senior resident, a junior staff, a senior staff, it's going to be professionally challenging. Um, we certainly don't have any regrets, but where we did it either time. Yeah, it totally depends too. If you want to have a big family, you might as not, you might as well get started earlier, but that might be a consideration that um, there's never not going to be always the ideal time. I will say, I will put another plug in though for the managing to deliver it's a little bit risky because if you go preterm uh, you could miss your exam but if you can time your delivery to right after your royal college before you would graduate and you're not studying and you have your mat leave and then you just you know have one or two weeks of vacation or elective or something and then you go on your way and that is if you can work it out it's really great get your math right don't be 36 plus trying to travel to ottawa it's <laughs> yeah you have to take into consideration where you live and where the exam is too but um it's it's a popular choice for obstetrics and gynecology residents at queen Univers queen's university perfect thank you guys so much um so i understand that you covered a couple of questions while i was looked out there but uh we'll go ahead with the next one and terry will start uh with you this time look looking back what is the one piece of it to give to other resident physicians that are contemplating having a family during residence um yeah so i actually flipped this question to my wife um and i was just wanted to see what she would say we both said the same thing and my one piece of advice is do it um like if you feel that you are personally ready within your own relationship, your own family planning stages in life, then I think you should do it. Um, as I said, there is no, there is no perfect time. Um, I, I know of several uh, attendings who are very early in their um, staff careers um, who have different challenges associated with having kids and that, you know, they're just starting to build a clinical practice and an ambulatory care practice. 
And then all of that has to stop um, for a certain number of weeks or months, depending on um, how long their leave is. Um, and, and that's not something that we have to deal with as residents because we are, uh, you know, the system isn't independently relied or reliant on us. We, we, are, we are certainly a big part of the service delivery model, um, but we don't carry our own patient load. And so, um, you know, I think there are unique challenges associated with staff, certainly, or with being staff. Certainly there's, um, you know, a different flexibility in that you are in, in some ways creating your own schedule um, and building your practice how you want it to be. And in, in your early years, that can be certainly lighter than um, when you're kind of in the later stages of your family planning. Um, but I think there is a lot more structure in residency and there's a lot more, um, I think, uh, support around you, um, whether it be co-residents, co-fellows, uh, staff, people, call schedules, and, and the financial pieces that we've already talked about. But I, I, I think, I think the pieces are there in place. And and again, if it was right, if it's right for you, then don't let being a resident deter you from from carrying out what what you aim to do as a resident, or as a as a, a parent. Sorry. Perfect. And Christina, um, I have I guess two pieces of advice. The first is basically Terry's except he was much more succinct in that in saying just do it um, and my husband and I talked about it and I was you know don't think that you don't spend I guess too much time agonizing over all the details although I just said if you can plan your delivery date after after the Royal College exam but but to I guess to have some flexibility because you just never know how things are going to work out um, and so not to get too fixated on um, on a specific outcome and trying to have a little bit of flexibility but but in the end that just means eh, go for it if you want to have kids because you you know you can only dictate so much um one though another although i just said don't plan too much one thing that you may take into consideration in your planning um is that it is important to have a supportive program in which you know i'm you you can be a parent in any program, um, but I have personally felt that my Obskine program and my MFM program they've really bent over backwards to make to make things work to for my family, um, and I've been immensely appreciative. Um, and if if you think you want to have a family, it doesn't hurt to and and you have you know if you're stuck between two fellowship programs, for instance, which are otherwise um, equal in your mind, if there's one that might be more supportive or where you're surrounded by people with families, that might be a consideration because it does make things easier when other people understand. Yeah, do it and plan if you can, <laughs> but recognize that um, some of these plans don't always work out exactly yeah. the way you want them to. But, uh, you know, I think the second person I told with our second child after my my parents were was my program director so you know i i made sure that everyone was in the loop as soon as possible because it does take a quite a bit of planning uh for those around you uh, to make the right pieces fall into place you guys that makes a lot of sense thanks so much terry we do have a question uh sort of specifically for you from uh, one of the participants so peter asks by taking paternal leave will you graduate your fellowship on time and is that a concern um, yeah, so it's a, again, a, I guess an, in, an individual um, situation. So I think this is going to be different depending on which program you're in and, and kind of how those discussions about um, waived training go. Um, so I will be, I've taken about 10 weeks of, of PAT leave. Um, being that I'm in a subspecialty program, it's two years. And so the Royal College will allow up to six weeks of training to be waived. Um, my program would be supportive of that if I felt comfortable near the end of my program that I didn't need that extra six weeks that I could take six of the weeks off. So I will be extended by at least four weeks. Um, it works out for me in that um, a lot of the fellowship programs coming out of, of uh, respirology are not um, so strict in the way the dates line up, um, in particular because we have a rural college uh, exam that's in the fall. And so some of them actually start after September or October. So I, I kind of knew that going into how much time I was going to take off. Um, but I also, you know, because my wife's a year behind me, I'm not sure that I'm actually going to be starting the fellowship right away. So it actually works out quite conveniently for me. 
Um, but that is going to be really dependent on, on the person and their, their specific uh, residency situation. Um, and certainly I had concerns about not being able to start this program, so my R4 year on time, if I took any amount of time off in my core internal medicine years. And so that impacted my decision not to take Pat leave the first time. Um, we also had a question that came in for, for uh, both of you. So uh, this person asked, did you find it challenging financially, especially with the cost of childcare? So Christina, maybe we can start with you. Um, uh, childcare is really, really expensive. Um, luckily you don't go out or buy yourself clothes or go to the salon or <laughs> go to dinner anymore. So you save some money <laughs> in some of those discretionary costs. Um, but it is, it is expensive. Um, you know, if, if you're somebody who's debating between the three, six year leave, um, it really doesn't make financial sense to come back early. Um, you know, I've almost been working just to pay the nanny um, because well, you decide when you feel comfortable putting your child into daycare. Four months was was young for us. I know some do, but we preferred to have a nanny, and so we were. I was working to work for some period of time, um, and then it depends where you are. But it's 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 very competitive to get into daycare in Vancouver. Um, nannies again, it's very it's a very competitive market. Um, I very briefly interviewed one nanny. Um, who was in West Vancouver, who was making $75,000 a year. And I just said, you shouldn't leave your job. Um, don't talk to me anymore. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's tough. Um, yeah. I mean, being in medicine is also financially challenging. So it's, it's hard to say, well, just try to save up for it. Um, but it, but it's, it's tough. Um, and you have to make sacrifices, vacation, whatever, your personal life. Um, uh, this is, is, this is where stay at home parents can be, can be really helpful, but this, this might be one thing if, if things were really tight, that it might be better to stay home for longer because childcare can be so tough. But regardless of what you do, the day you have a positive pregnancy test, put it, put the fetus on daycare lists. Yeah. So I, th I think, um, childcare is expensive. Um, if you need to go with something full time. So a lot of people have uh, supportive families, supportive parents who are, are nearby and can help out a lot with that. I know a number of uh, friends of mine are, are in very different situations about the childcare piece. Um, with our first kid, we actually shared uh, a, a full time nanny with another couple. And so that was a cost saving option for us. And the, we really liked the flexibility of the hours. Um, with uh, having two kids, uh, the sharing wasn't an option anymore. And so we're actually going to full-time daycare. Um, unfortunately, because we're both physicians, um, our, our schedules are, are really challenging and strict. And so we, we almost have to go with a private option with extended hours and the morning and into the evening um, just for those long days. Um, and so it will be expensive. And, you know, it's something that we've been thinking about a lot and I'm HMOing, uh, you know, more this year to try to cover it but uh, as Christina said you know the the vacation pieces I actually found that vacation doesn't really feel like vacation right now anyway so um, we, you know we're not too keen to fly to Hawaii well Hawaii is a different issue right now but uh, um, you know it, it's vacation is different than what it used to be and so I, we just find ways to save money and um, and I think it's just something that you need to account for uh, as Christina said, I, I put uh, our, we put our names on a list for public daycares um, six months into Sarah's first pregnancy, and we still haven't heard back. So um, it's a really challenged system right now. And I think if I were to ask the hospital system or the, the healthcare system in general, in terms of how they could better support people who are in this stage of their personal lives, I think having more hospital-based childcare in Manitoba is something that we would certainly look for because. It does exist, but um, it's, it's extremely limited. Um, and so, so that has added challenges just in terms of geography and traveling to and from sites and yeah. work. In general, I would say you, you have to cut some of the, you know, I don't know, Starbucks or uh, discretionary things like that, because I think when it becomes tight, spending your money on things that make your life easier so the hours for daycare or the nanny or someone to clean your house I think those are 
for, for everybody, they say it, you get more happiness from your money if you spend it that way. But I think especially when you're having a kid on a resident salary, that's, um, that's what you just need to do. Terry, would you mind just uh, mentioning briefly the sort of option that uh, you have now where you're with a private system that you might actually be able to travel with your children on elective and access daycare there through the same company? Yeah, so I don't know how many companies are out there that do a similar thing, but um, the daycare that we're actually going to be using is called Kids and Company. And I, you know, I, I specifically have visited the daycare uh, that exists in Vancouver, so where Christina is. Um, and one of the reasons we went with them is A, a the extended hours. Um, they also provide meals for our kids, which is a huge plus when you're trying to rush um, or, uh, you know, rush to work or getting home from a call shift, having not to prepare meals is, is fantastic. Um, but I think, uh, lastly there, the, because it is a national company, there, there are sites that exist in other places. So if my wife and I, um, travel with the children for electives, or, um, you know, if we transition to a fellowship somewhere, if there is space available, I think there is an option to have our kids, uh, temporarily or, um, uh, permanently transition into another facility in a different city, um, which is a huge plus um, when you consider, um, how often we have to move around as trainees. Childcare is actually another place where social media can be helpful. Um, so the like all of the different Facebook moms groups will be able to give you recommendations about daycares or, you know, someone's nanny is leaving and looking for another position and there's it's extremely helpful. Um, finding a nanny is based there's like a Canadian nanny website that's basically a Facebook for nannies um, and then there are specific child child care Facebook groups and it can be helpful especially when you're doing call you know if you make an if you foster a relationship with one or two say university students who want to pick up extra um, babysitting hours then they'll they'll know your kid and so they can they'll they'll do overnights they'll do weekends like they can they can fit with a flexible schedule um, and there also are nannies like nannies on call um, where they have a they have a whole roster of nannies who are available on an emergency basis um, if you need overnight or if kid the baby's sick at daycare and you can't miss work and you need somebody to come in. Um, so those are, oh, those are other services that are available. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks so much, guys. Um, so what do you think, if anything, needs to be changed in the way that the faculties of medicine handle uh, the transition around parenthood? Terry, maybe we can start with you this time. Yeah, sure. So I, I mentioned a couple of things. I think uh, structurally having rooms that are available for, for pumping or breastfeeding specifically, it would be important to, you know, our residents here. Um, and I think having more hospital based uh, childcare options um, is, is the other piece that I've mentioned. The last thing that, uh, that I would mention is, you know, that transition back to work um, is is quite challenging, um, particularly if it, did, it it depends, you know, personally what your supports are, are like and, and who's able to do pickups and, and that sort of thing when you're on call, um, what what your spouse or, or partner is, is uh, what their career looks like. But, um, you know, I think especially as we get in, as I mentioned to this competency by design piece where you're having to prove certain competencies and, and maintain those throughout your training, um, I think it would be you know, important to have different kinds of training options transitioning back to work. Like all of us, all everyone that I'm aware of gets sort of plopped back in right where they left off back into a full-time schedule. Um, and for some people that, that can be their busiest rotation, for some people that can be a lighter rotation. Um, uh, not every program is willing to give you a vacation in that first month back um, as worked out for uh, Christina quite nicely. Um, you know, I, I, I think when I go back, because uh, I took most of my vacation early on in my R4 year, I won't actually be in R5 until later in the fall. And so vacation wouldn't be an option for me at all going back. And so I think there needs to be some flexibility in what that transition back to work looks like. Having part-time options for a month or two, um, looking at kind of more of a graduated responsibility model uh, if you've taken a leave of a year. Um, I'm not sure that those... Uh, transitions are as well thought out as they could be um, on an individual by individual basis. Um, it's worked out well for us, um, but I think we've been lucky and I, I think I could see it being quite challenging for people, especially with more extended leaves. Thanks, Christina. 
Terry took the words right out of my mouth. Um, I think that the having a flexible approach to return to work is not just something that would benefit moms and dads who are coming back after a leave, but but anybody who's who's coming back from a leave for any reason, just to um, to help people succeed in their training in general um, and and to be productive part of the workforce. Um, is, is extremely important. The way we do it now is a total disservice to, to people who have taken a leave for any reason. Um, uh, Terry mentioned something about vacation. I just wanted to touch on it. At least in the PERO contract, you still accrue vacation when you're on maternity leave. So that was really nice that in this year where I took four months of maternity leave, I got my full vacation, which meant I got to pack a year's worth of vacation into the rest of the year. Um, which allowed me to build my own kind of gradual return. Most of my work left was research, so I, I was actually able to have it a bit more tailored than most people can. Um, but that's just the one thing that I, that I thought of that I want people to know about because I don't want them to miss out on their vacation with their young child. Nice. Okay. I'm not aware Thanks. of that being in the PERM contract, but that Check would be it. <laughs> Perfect. I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we're slowly running out of time. So we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. So if any of the attendees had any questions that they wanted to make sure they got in before we wrap up, uh, please send in your questions now. Um, I did have a couple of other questions here that uh, the wellness committee had generated. Um, do you guys have any tips for completing busy rotations during pregnancies? When you think about things like maintaining proper nutrition, you know, compression stockings, all those sorts of things that people chat about. Christina, maybe we can start with you. Uh, again, maybe it's easier when you're more a sort of senior resident, but, but putting your foot down, and I don't mean that like in a super um, uh, arrogant or pushy way, but um, people just go about their days and the OR goes on as long as it does and people just start thinking about you and that's not malicious, they're just not. Um, and I think if any pregnant person said, can I have a break for water? Well, in most cases, the, the request would be happily um, granted. So I think it's just about um, making yourself hurt a little bit, which can be so tough in residency because you're already trying to get by and it's hard to raise your voice about your own personal needs. You feel like you're entitled, but, but I think it's generally not frowned upon and most people want pregnant people to take care of themselves. Um, it's like, it's like being the med student in the, um, in the OR. It's much better to ask to sit down when you start to feel lightheaded than to crash and ruin the sterile field. So I think just you know, take your, take your breaks as you need them. And, um, and, and like I said about the pumping, a little bit of education, I think goes a long way. Um, uh, compression stockings are good for comfort. Um, I feel like I'm at my Royal College now, but yes, staying hydrated, <laughs> staying hydrated, eating, I, I don't know, but that's all about, about making time for yourself. Um, yeah, I don't know what other tips I have other than kind of just making yourself heard. Okay. And Terry? Well, it's obviously very different for me, um, but I feel like, you know, as a, as a parent of young kids, um, you know, it's certainly my personal hygiene takes a backseat to their well-being. And so um, in particular, I, I think the sleep is something that um, until that four to eight month range when they get consistent sleep schedules is something that was really challenging for uh, my wife and I, and so we, we tried a lot of different ways, you know, sleeping in different rooms, one with the baby in the room, one without, taking turns, that sort of thing. And so I think just being really deliberate about your sleep. And um, I was someone who previously, I think, would have pushed myself through a lot of uh, work situations where I was exhausted. Uh, whereas now, you know, I'm just very conscious of what I need for sleep hygiene, and, and, and I take time for myself from that perspective. And so um, that's really all that I <laughs> have to offer as the the supportive partner in this this partnership of parenthood. In some ways, it's almost easier for the well. It, it, the experience, I'm sure, is just different being a mother and being a father. But like, take pregnancy for example. You you have this kind of visible reminder to everybody of your needs, but it must be a bit more difficult um, as a father to voice. It's just not as obvious for people, I would think. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got this dad bod now, so. <laughs> <laughs> 
And tube socks, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really important point though, Terry, because I think that in medicine, you know, we often push ourselves and don't get great sleep quality as it is, whether you're on call or studying late or whatever the case may be. So I think being ever mindful of that as you transition into parenthood is definitely a, an important point. Okay, so this is uh, the last question that we wanted to ask you guys. Um, how has becoming a parent impacted the way that you do your job, interact with your patients, or your focus on your work-life balance? So Terry, if we could start with you this time. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think, I think I mentioned a little bit uh, earlier, but the way I approach my job is very different in that um, we have to be very organized and, and strict around our schedules. And so, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how my my call is going to line up with with the, the parental duties and the child care duties. And so um, I don't really have the flexibility that I used to have in terms of taking other people's call uh, when they're in certain call conflicts um, with their own personal schedules. And so I do have to rely on other people from that perspective. Um, I guess that's just kind of a practical tip. Um, I don't think that my my viewpoint and my outlook on my career has really changed. I still have the same career aspirations, and if I thought that you know becoming a father would have impacted those um, greatly, uh, you know, it's not something that I would have gone into with the same sort of attitude that I had. And, and so I think it's important to think that uh, we as physicians, obviously, our career is really important to us. It's something that we've worked towards for a really long time, and so I've tried to maintain that in parenthood as much as possible. Um, of course what I'm doing and how I'm doing it has changed and I think changed for the better. I think I'm much more deliberate about how I'm going about this and, and, and the pace is appropriate. Um, my wife and I both have a, a similar approach to the, the patient relationship situation. So um, I think becoming a parent has changed my uh, emotional response to a lot of situations that I get at work uh, because I just have had such a massive change in my perspective on life and caring for others and I have two dependents now um, and so it's put me in a lot of situations that I never really have had uh, an opportunity for before um, and I think that's that's really made me a better physician um, because I able I'm able to relate to uh, my patients uh, so much better I am sure that's doubly true for uh, Christina um, but uh, yeah I think because Time's limited. I, I will end there, but it, it, you know, it's it's impacted my life uh, tremendously, obviously. And we'll go to Christina. Um, so sorry, it's how becoming a parent. I was just so absorbed by Terry. How becoming a parent? <laughs> my uh, outlook on work. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so like if you've had any changes to your outlook on work or your approach yeah. to your work, um, yeah. how you relate to and interact with your patient. Right. Uh, so I think becoming a parent is uniquely informative as, uh, as an obstetrician and in maternal fetal medicine, um, especially in maternal fetal medicine, we see a lot of really sad, difficult pregnancies. Um, and whereas I think I always empathize with my patients, my heart really breaks for them now. Um, I hope it makes me a better doctor and a better, um, a better doctor for my patients. Um, uh, I, I hope that it doesn't um, affect my, my well-being because I, like, I think I take things home more than I used to, um, which is good in the relationship I'm able to, bring with, to build with my patients. And I think it just makes me come home and hug my daughter a little bit tighter at night. But it feels, it feels scary to know what could happen to something you love so much. Um, but certainly I know what my patients are going through a lot more and that's to their benefit for me to, to be more understanding of, of what they're going through. Not with the pregnancy complications per se, but just parenthood. Um, I would be lying if I said my, um, my priorities haven't changed. Um, I really felt like having a child was, was really life changing and she, and, and my husband, my family, I think they, they bring me so much joy and, um, they actually give me more resilience, um, but they're the most important thing to me, which uh, it's just different from how it was, was before. Um, I used to stay at work because, you know, 
as long as, as long as there was something interesting or a case, or even if you just have to stand in the back of a room to show that you're keen, I would do that. And I don't do that anymore, but I'm also not in a program where that's expected because, um, like I said, the program I'm in is extremely supportive of, of parents, so I haven't felt like that's a problem. Um, I've definitely cut down on the number of things that I do, but I have to say that's also coincident in my work with resiliency because I think I, in the, de in the development of that curriculum, I really came to appreciate what it why it would benefit myself and my patients to have more balance. And so I have actually really pared down on the things that I do. And I decided to start parenthood and fellowship doing fewer things. And then I might start and add a little bit more as I, as I get on my feet a bit more. Um, you just are not that productive with a child, certainly not like you were before. So I expect less of myself, but I was thinking about this. I think about it more like not lowering your expectations, but setting yourself up for success. So if you don't plan to do too much in a day, um, then you can achieve it and it will feel good <laughs> um, and you will be successful. And it's important because obviously you don't want to disappoint people at work. You want to take care of your patients, but also I don't, I don't give my husband um, expectations unless I think I can meet them, you know, in terms of when you're going to come home, what are you going to do for the kid? Because you really have to be dependable when there's a child. So it's, it's not like it was before where you would just cram as much into your schedule as you could. And then you would just manage to get it done. Um, I try to be more realistic now. Um, but so my daughter having the effect of slowing me down is actually really great because I feel like it's, um, it's helped me become more mindful to have to just focus on being with her because that's what she needs. And it's been the greatest joy in my life. Yeah, it's uh, you, you get that break after the kids go to bed and you're like, I'm not doing work. <laughs> I'm going to just sit here and veg and yeah. then go to sleep. And so, you know, there was there would be hours of work uh, after work um, and that just can't happen anymore. Um, so it cer certainly changes the administrative perspective that uh, that I have on my job, too. That That's great. Christina. But on the other hand, I was um, doing a locum recently out of town for a couple of days away from the family and I didn't actually have much clinical work to do. And so you get this motivation. Like if I do all my research right now in this hotel room, I get to spend more time with my baby. And I was way more productive than pre-child Christina would have been. So there it's not all doom and gloom for your career for sure. Yeah. You have to be organized, but you're way more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you both so much uh, for taking the time to be panelists uh, for this important discussion tonight. I think your answers were completely on point and incredibly helpful to a lot of residents who are thinking about, uh, you know, planning a family during the residency. And as, you know, parents, we really appreciate you taking the time out. We understand how valuable your time is. Uh, so we really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, spend with us tonight. Um, so thank you guys for the amazing discussion. Um, we are out of time, uh, but just before we sign off, I did want to let everybody know that uh, the RDOC Wellness Committee has created a really valuable resource regarding this topic. Uh, so if you do want more information uh, organized by province, you can check out uh, the RDOC website. It's www.residentdoctors.ca forward slash family. Uh, we've compiled, like I said, a variety of resources that new parents or parents that to be can uh, check out in terms of top up and things like that. Yeah, so it's really informative. So please uh, uh, take a look at it and uh, hopefully it'll be a little bit more about some of the things that we've talked about tonight to inform your decisions. Once again, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, hopefully everybody found it beneficial and thank you very much, Christina and Terry. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Julia. Thanks to thanks people who stayed up until May 23rd to listen to us talk. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.